All right. Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo. You might know me from these weekly live streams or perhaps you know me from Live Keyboardist. And in either case, we are so happy that you are here. Uh, we're about to jump in with our special guest and Gig Performer family member, really. I mean, this guy is all over the channel sharing wisdom with Gig Performer about uh, all sorts of different things, keyboard rigs, um, setups. If you've been following Gig Performer, you know Matt Vanacoro. He's backstage. Uh, he's going to share with us today um, five of his go-tos for making sure a live key rig works, right? Like the most important part of a live keyboard rig, the number one most important thing is that it works <laughs> and that it works all the time. Um, so in, uh, in light of that, go ahead and let us know in the comments, what has been your largest live performance setup failure so far? Like, let us know the time where it went really bad um, and what you think caused it. I'm definitely curious, and um, hopefully we can uh, shine some light on uh, how to help you overcome that. Um, welcome, Bill. So happy to have you here. Jeff and Bill, regular attenders, seeing you guys here every week. We've got a new, uh, a new viewer today, which we're excited about. Tim, so happy that you could be here live. Um, and glad that Gig Performer has been a game changer for you. I know it's been a game changer for a lot of people. It was a game changer for me. Um, Bill Andre is writing in, is that David's rig in the picture? Bill, you would be correct. That is indeed David's keyboard rig. Um, uh, Bill is talking about the thumbnail. Um, okay, so uh, heads up for everybody. Next week, we will not have a backstage live stream, but... We will uh, have a video that is going to be released. Um, we've got a, a more uh, technologically sound version of the interview that we did with Miko from a couple of weeks ago that I'll be dropping uh, at the same time. And it'll be a premiere, so there will still be um, you know, a live element. You guys can chat in the comments, but there will be no live stream. However, September 1st, we will be back with a special guest, John. I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name. It's a real good one. Um, I'll let you guys do that. But um, John is actually the software developer of uh, a software called Songmaster, which is a really great tool to help you learn songs. Sort of analyzes things. You can speed it up and slow it down. It's super in-depth. Um, but he's also a friend of Gig Performer. He actually um, opened up some OSC implementations. So you can control um, Gig Performer uh, from Songmaster and Songmaster from Gig Performer uh, using OSC messaging, which actually makes it a really powerful tool for practice. And I think also maybe for running backing tracks. Um, and he's going to come show us all about that on September 1st. Um, Thomas says one of his largest fails was forgetting to switch his rig from his home version to his stage setup. Um, I, and I'm like, man, I'm glad that that's been the, the largest fail for you, Thomas. Um, I think my largest failure of all time, uh, I was running uh, the program that shall not be mentioned. I was running <laughs> running main stage and it, uh, it stopped. It just stopped working um, during sound check and it then would not reboot. It crashed my entire computer every time I opened it. And that was also the the last time I used main stage. Um, but definitely that was my largest fail. So if you want to share uh, what yours was, we'll come back to that uh, in a moment here. But without further ado, uh, we are going to bring on Matt Vanacora to help us understand how to avoid these large failures. Um, so Matt, welcome to the stream. Ah, How's it going, guys? Great to see you. I, you know, I didn't know you were going to ask that. I, I want to share my largest fail. Man. I want to hear it. <laughs> I want to hear it. What I had a spectacular fail? fail with the program that shall not be named. <laughs> it was back <laughs> like version one. Wow. Um, wow. And it's one of the best. So I, I play this gig with this guy, Mark Wood. Um, he's the founding member of Trans-Siberian Orchestra. So we do a lot of classical metal yeah. type stuff. Yeah. And I used main stage, you know, uh, you know, when it first came out, it was one of the first like live performance rigs I was ever setting up. And he was insistent, you know, it was early on in using computers as your sound source. So he was really insistent on not seeing the computer on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, so all I was able to have was like a giant TV hooked up to the computer off stage so I could see the patch names. But I, I had programmed a foot pedal, you know, to just go next patch, previous patch. So I plug everything in. I had it run in <laughs> and I'm paging through the show. We're doing all these classical songs, but, you know 
sort of like inspired with metal stuff and it's not like a lot of heavy piano stuff but there is one like piano we did we were doing like a moonlit sonata um type thing in the middle of one of these songs and so about a third of the way through the show the tv monitor just goes blank and the entire rig shut off and what i had found out so i run to the side of the stage and i found the drummer's phone charger he had unplugged my computer to charge his phone and that particular uh piece of software would not let you know in full screen if the if the computer was plugged in or not so i had no idea that through the first half of the show my battery was just slowly draining until it turned off so i plugged it back in i turned it on i i opened up the you know the concert and literally the concert is still the show is still going on behind me uh, fortunately, it wasn't a particularly important keyboard part. And so I ran back out and then I realized that I didn't, because I was so nervous, I didn't switch to where we were in the show. And again, this is a Trans-Siberian Orchestra type thing. There, There's thousands of patches. So I'm I'm stepping on my next patch button like like a tap dancer, like, like really fast going, next, 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 and I'm trying to get there. And I know that we're getting to the, the Moonlit Sonata keyboard solo. And I did not make it in time. And oh. I just, it came up to it and I started playing. And the sound, because we were doing a previous piece was like themes from movies. I had dinosaur sound effects <laughs> set up. So the name of the patch was Brontosaurus Whale that I played uh, the, the Moonlit Sonata piano solo on. <laughs> and you have never seen a more confused conductor of a orchestra. <laughs> And it took me like after like three more steps, I found a you know a piano patch. But like I played the first like few notes, and you just heard dinosaurs <laughs> screaming in the middle of uh, this quiet piano solo moonlit sonata thing. So oh, it's so yeah. Bad. <laughs> Lesson learned, kiddos. That was back early. That was you know over a decade ago. It was like back when no one, not a lot of people were doing it yet. But yeah, yeah, man. There are things that you just don't think about being important until they're important, <laughs> like like this right like yeah you wouldn't think well it's funny it's like it it is kind of what inspired me to start dialing in and going i never want that to happen ever again so i said (laughs) i'm I'm gonna really stress test everything and come up with you know contingency plans for you know Mm -hmm. anytime uh that happens And, and and so far you know fortunately i've had the opportunity to work with some some great keyboard players and We've been putting their put their rigs to the test, so this stuff doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Gosh, that's a good one, <laughs> Brontosaurus whale. Yep. Fantastic. Um, Thomas also had an overheated computer during sound check. Yeah, oh, outdoor yeah. shows. That's another. I actually played a show once. We were doing a version of Uptown Funk. This was a kids' show, um, and I was using. I was playing drums which is a whole nother story, but I was playing um, like electronic drums on the push. And oh, right. I, I'd actually done this, this song a couple of times for some other venues, but it was the middle of the day. So I couldn't tell what pads I was hitting because you can't see the lights. Oh my the, God. Yeah. And that weak LEDs too. that uh, the, the yeah. push. Yeah. Um, so I remember that being interesting. Cause I was like, I have gotten so used to seeing the visual feedback of the lights um goodness well matt yeah. I, was, I feel like we, that story kind of gave us a hint but do you want to give us just a brief overview of who you are and what you do and and all that good stuff sure sure so you know my name uh as brett said guys my name is matt vanicoro um i work with a lot of different companies um to kind of stress test their gear consult with their gear and to do educational content to like show you how to do stuff with uh plugins so i i've been doing it with so many different, you know, software companies, you know, one of my favorites, of course, being a gig performer, but it's, it's great. What the way the synergy kind of works is, you know, there's very few plugins out there that I haven't used, you know, um, I've reviewed them for ask audio, a a blog that I write for, and I I've at least, you know, had it pass through my computer once or twice, usually if it exists. So I've had the unique opportunity to be able to really try like a lot of different instruments and, um, be able to figure out what ones kind of are resource hogs, what ones, uh, are a little more on the safe side to use, uh, you know, what ones have different features. And through that, uh, I also have the good fortune of being able to set up some live rigs for 
uh, my friends and for for other you know keyboardists in the industry. I, I, I've worked with with Tom Brislin of Kansas, Jordan Rudis of Dream Theater, uh, John Karen of Pink Floyd, and you know kind of dialed in there, help them dial in their setups, and absolutely have answered the phone while they're on stage at soundcheck and things. <laughs> Things aren't weren't working as they'd seem. So, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, I, I'm knock on wood to say that's never had to happen with a rig that I've set up, though. But, mm-hmm. but that's, yeah. uh, you know, we, um, you know, I, I, I go through uh, quite a bit to really stress test these kind of rigs before they go out and hit the road. And um, I think that uh, it's been a really bl- a real blast. You know, it's been interesting to work with some of these artists and hear some of them, you know, recreating classic sounds from synthesizers and parts that they've used on the road and then being able to find the best way to get them to be able to use live hosting software and use gig performer to, you know, queue up their show. And it's really interesting because it's such a wide variety from, you know, Broadway guys to the rock scene where like you have some guys that want to see everything on the screen with a million controls and have control of every sound. And then some guys that want to see literally just the name of the patch. They want to set it at the beginning of the tour and never think about it again. They just want to switch to that sound and have it work. So mm-hmm. um, I've got uh, I've had a lot of fun dialing in uh, a lot of keyboardists and, and kind of getting them uh, on the path to live hosting software, which has been great. And what what would you say? Just I'm I'm like asking this because I want to know what would you say the biggest resistance is to using a computer solution because some of these guys like definitely started with hardware <laughs> like oh yeah no, no all of them so, so sometimes would... it's a bear to like recreate all the sounds right if you've been in a band for 20 years all your sounds are in one platform you know sometimes it can be a, a bit of a beast to recreate it but sometimes you know all it takes is to remind them that that stuff is kind of the fun part of being a keyboardist it can mm-hmm. be right you know I know it might seem like a drag, but I, I don't know. I mean, I just I get excited about you know plugins and sound design and stuff, and so I, I I don't mind that as much. But I would say you know sometimes they worry about computers and just the computer failing, and all it takes is to kind of remind them often like, hey, you you know the keyboard you're using is a computer, right? Like you know, that you're aware that that you know if you're using a Chronos, you know, Core Chronos or something like that's. It's running, you know, I mean, there were some that for a while that were running Windows CE, like back in the day, like the little Windows Palm Pilot software yep. and stuff. So, you know, and and, the, and you kind of explain if you want it to be as reliable as your keyboard, then, you know, you can do things. There are things that you can do to set up your computer and set everything up to make sure that it's as reliable as your keyboard and that it's not going to crush. So some, you know, sometimes the resistance is getting people to buy into the fact that you should have a computer dedicated just for your mm. music that you're not going to let your kid play Roblox on or something. <laughs> you, know. you might end up with a whale sound. Um, yeah, you could. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. I do hear people say like, ah, oh, you know, I don't trust, you know, a computer. Yeah. But, but people I, don't, treat their computers like instruments right yeah well that's that's and that's the thing you have to be able to do for sure because like you know look my i've had i've had live keyboards crash i mean they're all computers now they really are i mean it's happened you know i've had to reboot and um i've had someone kick a plug out and you know it's funny this uh, brontosaurus whale story aside yeah you show me another keyboard that has a battery backup in it that will last for a couple of hours if the plug gets kicked out accidentally yep. you know what i mean like that's even with even if you're plugged into a ups you know you turn your keyboard the wrong way guitarist moves over to the stage the wrong way and your keyboard blips and is unplugged, and then you've got a problem. So I, there, there are a lot of benefits to using a computer because, you know, if your power goes out for a second, I'm not rebooting anything. Everything works just fine. You know, it's all plugged into my computer. My computer has a battery. And nowadays, too, like with modern computers and with the, I mean, you know, you're back when I was doing my Brontosaurus story, I was using a MacBook that was probably like eight years old at that point. So, you know, the battery was uh, creaking along. If that happened, I-, I could play an entire show with my current laptop's charge, and mm-hmm. it would be fine. You know, mm-hmm. so um, it's a lot different now, and 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 that those are those are benefits now. It's not a you know, it's not a negative. It's it's actually quite positive. Mm-hmm. I've certainly had people kick my computer, my uh, keyboard plug out when I'm playing live before. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had it happen. 
um it yeah absolutely do you would you say that like do you, is that what you start with like do you recommend like if somebody was like i'm getting ready for a tour what should i take with me would you always recommend a computer like i'm sure you deal with hardware too like what would what would you tell people and why so you know it always like i'm i'm a realist you know and i talk to these guys like i i do work with people that are going on tours that have budgets and i go work with people that are playing in cover bands and they're going to do their thing and and it's a different situation for everyone you know if you told me like i needed a, another new macbook pro tomorrow for my you know a tour like i that would be a, that's a tough sell for me to you know find a couple grand to drop it mm-hmm. um so I, I'm reasonable and, and realistic about that. But again, there's things you can do. Like I, I'll say like, okay, well, you do you have a computer dedicated for audio? Can we reformat that and wipe it entirely and then make it, you know, dedicated just for this stuff? So there, there's, it's, there's, it's not always like black and white, like you have to buy a new computer that day. Mm-hmm. The other thing I'll say is that people don't realize how um, modest you can make a computer and still get great sounds from it. You know, mm-hmm. my my top of the line four thousand dollar keyboard workstation has, I think, two gigabytes of RAM. Like, like you know, right. like that's yeah. So the sound, the piano sound, it loads up is like a hundred megabytes. You know, yeah. like it's not. So I, I know that like we look at some of these, you know, three terabyte sound libraries and things like that, and sound libraries that come in on a giant hard drive. But let's just remember that the ones that are inside your keyboard are often very very small and the sound samples are already compressed way down to mp3 level and stuff so i've done i've set up tours um i've set up keyboardists going on the road with literally the entry level macbook you know Mm -hmm. and i've done a gig myself i mean i had to do a gig i i did a thing at sweetwater demonstrating um some products for samson a while back and it was just when i had uh i had actually my my macbook pro had broke so I borrowed my wife's MacBook that she used just for Safari. Like it was mm-hmm. the entry level, cheesiest, least expensive MacBook. I swear to God, I'm a good husband. I, she just doesn't need that stuff. <laughs> she has no need for it, you know. But like I, I, I set up a rig with it and and used it and and like the sounds are fantastic. You know, mm-hmm. obviously I, you know, I'm not loading it up with 90 gigabytes of ivory, but. <laughs> part of the thing of what we're going to talk about is like, you don't always need that. You know, there are times when I do need that. And there are times when I don't, I, I guess I always look at, you know, there's, there's in reviewing, since I've reviewed so many of these products, I don't look at it as this is a good instrument. This is a bad instrument. I more look at it as this is a good instrument for this particular use. And this is a good instrument. This one's better for this use. You know, Mm -hmm. I absolutely need to have a piano that can run lean and mean you know, Mm -hmm. and I absolutely in my recording studio like to have a piano that takes up 90 gigabytes, you know, I mean, I guess I don't love that it's 90 gigabytes, but I like the realism and stunning features that are on it. There's, there's a way, you know, there are, there's a use case for both and you know, neither is better or worse. So as I said, you can really set up with a lot more modest stuff than you think sometimes. Absolutely. And so it's like context is key. key. Just all the time. Context means everything. Um, wow. Fantastic. Okay. I feel like I had another question about that, but I'm like, we're 20 minutes in. We haven't even started talking about all your stuff. Do you, do you want to, um, do you want to talk us through like what, what your five things are? And then maybe we can, uh, dive into one yeah, of sure. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, one of the first things that I like to think about, um, is, you know, how many keyboards is this person looking to do? You know, there are people that approach things and want to do everything with one keyboard. There are tours and people that approach things and want to have multiple keyboards. You know, they want to be able to play things on two keyboards at once. And when you're setting that up, um, I, you know, that can be something that I think that I look to the first place to like squeeze a little resources out of. Cause I've seen people do two keyboard setups where they're using piano on the bottom and they're using, different synths or, you know, B3 organ and stuff on the top. And they're making patches that have a new copy of the piano loaded up, you know, every time for the bottom keyboard. And one of the things that Gig Performer likes to do, and if you don't mind, I'll share my screen and just kind of pop it up. One of the things that Gig Performer, you know, a great feature of it is is using that um, global rack space so that if you want to set stuff up for your entire concert, you can, and then you can have patches um, and different rack spaces, you know, local ones on a rotating basis, change your top keyboard. So 
if I go to this global rack space button right here in the upper left corner, I, for example, I'll give you an example. And I, I've set this up for many people. Like I've got plenty of touring keyboardists that want to have one keyboard be piano the whole night and be nothing but piano. And that's oh, they don't want to think about it. Whatever patch they're on, if they touch those keys, it better be a piano. So I, the first thing I do is I say, well, then let's not make two keyboards in your regular rack space because you don't need to see that. You don't need to clog everything up. You don't need to use multiple copies of the plugin. Let's go to your global rack space and let's set up a keyboard. So let's say I'll just quickly set up a, you know, piano tech, which is a nice little lean and mean piano. All right, we got a nice little Steinway. So it's right there. And what I'll do there, I don't, you know, I, I could do the, you know, two rack spaces audio thing, but I don't even need to do that. I'll just connect piano tech directly to the outputs of the, um, Op, you know, of the audio interface. And now from here, I'll just drop in a MIDI input and I'm not gonna do an Omni one. I'm gonna do one that is specific to one keyboard. So my Keylab 88, I got two keyboards plugged in. So now anytime I touch my Keylab, I'm gonna get piano, all right? There it is. So you'll notice even if I go to my regular rack space, there's nothing there, okay? I can just go over here, I'll set up a MIDI input. Let's do my quote unquote top keyboard, right? Um, that's going to be my complete control. And let's say that one for this song, I want that keyboard to be, um, you know, a, a synth, you know, let's just grab, uh, oh, I don't know. God, there's so many, maybe I need to, <laughs> how do you choose? Some of these. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How does one pick? Let's just go to FM eight really quick. Right. I like FM. I'm on an FM kick lately. Are you, are you, uh, um, are yeah. All right. So I got FM8, we'll pop it up. I'll just grab any sound right there. This could be the worst one in the world. We'll find out. It's going to be more dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm going to have PTSD. Uh, so I'll connect FM8. There we go. And now there's your typical FM sound. So I'm playing my top keyboard. I got my FM sounds. And I got my bottom keyboard. It's on piano. And you don't even see the bottom keyboard on the screen. So I don't have to worry about it clogging up the screen. I don't have to worry. It's almost like you forget about it and you're like, look, that keyboard is piano all night. And the most important thing is like, I'm using one routing for it, one copy of the plugin. If I change, tweak a little thing on it, I don't have to tweak every single rack space. I can go in um, and just make a change in the global rack space. If I want to change the model of the piano, that piano for all intents and purposes is a real piano the whole night. Yep. And now since it's global, I am actually saving, you know, on obviously, you know, processor and resources because I'm not doing like 20 copies of the same thing. Absolutely. So that's one of the first things I like to do is kind of jump in and say, hey, before we program this stuff up and you have 40 different, you know, rack spaces and, you know, do you actually do that do you need a piano the whole night do you know i mean i i i play with a funk band mm -hmm. and i have one set up as a fender rose the whole night mm -hmm. i mean that's what i do so and i like to not i love you know it's just it helps also people it helps them sometimes with their uh you know you asked before about the psychological barrier sometimes of starting yeah. it up uh it kind of helps from there um it kind of helps from there, like to go, you don't have to think about that keyboard. It's going to be, it's almost as if you brought your real Fender Rhodes. It's sitting there, there. And answer Thomas's question, yeah, so I don't use the Omni MIDI inputs anymore in the main rack space because I wouldn't want to trigger, um, you know, that accidentally. So um, one of the, you know, again, I, I actually, I only use Omni MIDI um, if I'm going to be using a single keyboard the whole night. Because if you're going to be using two keyboards, you want to get out of the habit of using the Omni MIDI. And to be fair, um, because I use some wacky stuff sometimes, uh, I almost never use the Omni MIDI anyway. Because I am, uh, I, I like, uh, I, <laughs> I have these arcade buttons that are MIDI-fied. And I use mm -hmm. them for next sound, previous sound. Oh, so nice. they're literally Street Fighter, Street Fighter 2, uh, like punch <laughs> and block buttons. Like yes. that, are, that sit on the corner of my keyboard and go back and forth. I just love the tactile feel of it. Like I, I don't, when I'm, um, when I'm playing myself and I go like on a tour, I never know what keyboard they're going to have when they show up. It doesn't matter what you put in the rider. I've found that people just don't even read. People just don't, they think the keyboardists are less high maintenance or something. I don't know. We always yeah. show up. The guitarist has the exact amp he, uh, he asked for, and I get whatever 
crap keyboard they, they could had. find at the yeah well yeah well so i and... always bring my own buttons for next sound previous sound um and i just it's got such a cool vibe i like arcade buttons i don't know because i'm a gamer yeah. so you know, it makes you feel cool... something right it's important yeah. um absolutely you, you were mentioning too like you know weird things like if you're running any other midi like if you're running like an iac driver if you're controlling a- external things like using midi omni can eventually create problems because you can have even non-keyboard things triggering things um yeah uh, so yeah using direct is uh <clears throat> the other thing to note is because of the way gig performer is set up if you do use like th- the benefit of using omni is that anything will work right but like if yeah, you yeah, yeah. do use a specific MIDI in block and you change it, Gig Performer will prompt you if you would like it to change across every rack space. So yeah, I love that because I, I love using manager. Rig Manager to like yeah. show up if I have a different keyboard and instantly have it map the buttons of the new keyboard to what I had. Like I'm, I'm I am very Type A about that kind mm-hmm. of stuff, and I think mm-hmm. again, it's it just comes from a place of like it has to work, it has right. to. So. Yep. Um, and I'm looking at Michael's question there for guitarists. It's funny you bring that up because I am a guitar doubler and that's one of the reasons why I got into gig performer and why I got into live performance software so that I could switch patches quickly and have my guitar muted without having to, like, I have some songs where I'm playing guitar and then I want to switch to keyboard. I don't want to like turn the volume off on my guitar and then go play keyboard. Like I want to just hit next sound and my guitar is muted. Um, so I actually do that a lot. Now I don't do that with the global rack space. If I am doing, and I, if I am doing a gig where I have the guitar through the global rack space, the controls on my virtual amps and stuff that stays static through the global rack space. Cause that's the point of the global rack space, but you could, and I'll pop on my screen again and Brett, you might even correct me if I'm wrong, but you could, instead of sending the output directly to your audio interface, you could send the output to the two rack spaces feature. Okay. So let's say I'll just throw one up there, right? Just as an example, I'll go to native instruments. Where's guitar rig? I'm not, I'm not plugging a guitar in and don't worry. I am the world's okayest guitar player. Um, <laughs> but what they I do could do for that. instead of sending the output of guitar rig six directly to the audio interface, I could send it to the two rack spaces function. Mm-hmm. And now the audio from that is going to the rack space. And if the rack space doesn't use it, you won't see it. Mm -hmm. And if I go to global processing and hit from rack spaces, there it is. So now I have the choice if, so I know you asked about like, can I change the volume of the channel, for example? Yeah, I could actually throw in an audio mixer, right? And I, I think, Brett, this is probably the best way to do this, but well, you can, again, correct the, me if I'm wrong. This is one way. I, the the other thing that Gig Performer does, which actually, Matt, you made the video on this, you can assign a widget a global parameter number. Oh, yes. So then if you are wanting to like, like whatever, you're using you know one particular setup, but you're wanting to change... A particular point of that from a local rack space you can map the widget to the global parameter number and then change the parameters but in order to do that you need to have widgets in the global rack space to control um, yeah so that's the other way to do it if you're trying to control the volume in guitar rig but the thing that about gig performer that's nice is you can use guitar rig plus valhalla reverb plus what like whatever you want so you could be using you know however many plugins in one atmosphere and in which case having just what you need locally in a local rack space using the to and from global rack spaces would be helpful um yeah i always i always think of it in um you know i i i, I am you know, i'm a little egocentric there in that <laughs> setup cuz i think of it in the way that i want it like yeah. i don't want to actually have a widget on the screen like i yeah. i just want it to be i know that that song i need the guitar lower so i just have it set that way but of course if you're only playing guitar um yeah well that's so what um so michael yeah what Brett had just said that's exactly what you're talk what 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 yeah. he's talking about like you can assign those things to a widget in the global rack space. Um, It's not just volume. You can assign whatever you want to a widget. And Matt's video actually does a great job outlining this. We'll try and link that below. Um, Additionally, the um, guitar with master effects template 
included with the desk queue version of gig performer demos how this works so if you want a rack space set up using local controls to control global widgets um to see how you would set this up just open that rack space and check it out um and also check out matt's video because yeah you absolutely can do this in gig performer um sweet yeah and yep. i guess the, the other thought i you, you kind of already covered this but just to reiterate like if you're an organ player that also plays other sounds maybe organ is what's in your global rack space like it really can be anything that you yep. use all the time but don't want to duplicate yeah um, i have um in in my most you know common one i i would say probably for myself i have like an acoustic guitar set up in my global rack space so i have it set up that i can just pick up my acoustic at any time in the show and play and it's got you know studio quality effects it's got all that stuff and i don't have to worry about it i can my patches are changing that's for my keyboards but the you know i don't have to deal with plugging my acoustic into the board and just dealing with whatever effects the guy happens to give me i have my acoustic sound that i like that you know yeah, uh, I'm a little bit of a diva. It's okay. Yeah. Well, and on the other side too is you kind of get used to things responding in a particular way. Like the the feedback that you get to your ears matters because it changes how you deal with your instrument. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm all about <laughs> look. My control for myself is is way better in in all cases because I'm the one who plays with this rig night after night. You know, so. Yep. He can change whatever he wants to uh, on the on the outside. I, I do send my acoustic out separately from, you know, my keyboard and stuff. And if he wants to compress it more or whatever. But I know that what I'm giving him is what I like to start right. with. And to answer Glenn's question quick about what I mean by arcade buttons, I mean literal buttons from an arcade machine. Um, uh, there, there's a, a company called Palette out there. I don't think they – I think they got bought by another company. They have another name now. But if you search for them, it's called Palette Gear. They make these buttons that are sliders. They were actually made for Photoshop and stuff, but they respond to MIDI as well. So you can plug them in and just set up Gig Performer to recognize one button as next sound and one button as previous sound. You can actually use actual buttons from arcade machines to change sounds, which is – that's my jam. In my head, I'm picturing like the buttons on the side of a pinball machine. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly what they are. Arcade buttons. Ton of fun. All right. So, you know, tip number two that I had up there that I was going to talk about. And Mm -hmm. this is this is probably, you know, you mentioned before resistance to stuff. This is probably one of the biggest hurdles sometimes to get over. But I've I haven't I've yet to meet a client that hasn't been happy when we got to the final position and at least thinking about this and that is to consider light versions of patches um when a certain sound might be buried in the mix you know so we we were talking about context and use case you know i've got i've got string sounds that are huge right i'll pop i'll pop one up really quick you know let's say if i go and use like contact um I pop up uh, like the symphonic strings, right? The symphonic essentials. Those are mm-hmm. those are pretty massive. And mm-hmm. if I was doing um, a section that was a solo part, I'll go ahead and use MIDI Omni now to make everyone happy. There we go. <laughs> And if I was going to play like a solo section in a show and I needed to get convincing string sounds, you know, I would definitely use something like this. You know, it's got, it's pretty big. Um, You know, it's, 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 it's one of the like really, really great sounding instruments. It's super responsive. Um, But that might not be what I use if I'm burying this sound in a, in a mix. You know, I've got guys that will layer in piano a synth, choir, ahs, and strings. And in those cases, that's where I try to have that, you know, come to the Lord moment with them and say, like, do you really need that seven gigabyte library on that sound if we're burying it so far in the mix? Would you consider a more efficient version um, that, you know, might not sound as fantastic on its own, but is going to layer really nicely and is going to save you a ton, you know? So I have versions like that. So if I just use that replace plugin feature, which is by the way, one of my favorite features in sound design, (laughs) I love, it it saves you so much time. Yeah. And I'll open up like UVI workstation, which has some great stuff. Like I love orchestral suite um, from UVI. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I use that for strings all the time. Or I'll just go to the contact factory library and just grab their factory string sounds. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if I pop this up, if you just take a look, like I'll just grab a string ensemble from orchestral suite really quick. And yeah, this is 72 megabytes <laughs> and it's using 0.5 CPU. Yeah. You know, like it's really efficient and it's really light on the CPU. Now, if I throw a piano in there, um, you know, and I'm going to do a quick layer. So let's have MIDI trigger that piano too. I'm not even going to throw any volume balancing and we don't have time for that stuff. Let's just do this. Yeah. <laughs> Like if I'm very, imagine now I'm burying, you know, a, a, a pad, a synth pad on top of there and a choir sound like, dude, I, I, that's where I try to like, you know, bring these guys home and just go like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hear that string sound enough to make it worth the chance that you're going to overload your processor a little bit. You lose a little responsiveness and that, you know, it, it really is though important because you can make lightweight quick rigs. Nothing makes me cringe more than when I open up, you know, a gig file on someone's computer and I hit next sound and, and a few times, like I'll hit it like eight times in a row going back to my brontosaurus days. Like, <laughs> and I watch how fast it pages through. Yeah. And that's like, that's like a thing for me. I'm like, okay, so it's a little risky. There's a bit of a gap there. It's taken a long time to tick down, you know? So maybe we can look at some of these patches and really, be honest with yourself about where it fits in the overall mix of the band that you're doing and where it fits in the overall mix of the sound design that you're doing. And can we pull back a little bit on some of them? Yeah. You know, obviously again, if you're playing and it's a solo spot, like when I'm playing a solo spot in a, in an orchestral thing, like, yeah, I want my big, massive, amazing, you know, sounding piano. Um, but if I'm doing a thing where it's layered behind a bunch of loud electric guitars and all that stuff, then that's when I start to consider, okay, do I, can I use a more efficient version of that plugin for this particular case and save myself a lot of resources? And I'll tell mm -hmm. you what, you, you really can, because you, you, you know, you can, if, if you're honest with yourself about it and you really think about it. Yep. Yeah. And you know, too, like, I'm pretty sure David actually just texted me for a link, but, um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure piano tech is David's piano sound. Like that's just, yeah. What piano tech is fantastic. Yeah. Like um, so some of the later libraries are actually like great. Like sometimes it's not even a concession. Sometimes it's just like a good idea. It's just, it's just a good yeah. idea. Um, well, some of the, because some of those hefty libraries too, now they have scripting and stuff and that stuff that like, I'll be doing that playing a piano pad sound, not realize that I got too low and triggered an articulation and all of a sudden the mm -hmm. orchestra is now tremoloing, yes. you know? So that's, I, that, that's a danger. Like it really is a danger. Like, and that would actually get into, um, that gets into one more, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out of order in the, in our you, list you a little bit. You want to quickly answer this question before you pop over to oh, that one? Sure. Sure. On uh, so on a MacBook, is there advantage to using AU versus VST, VST3? All right, so um, I get wary about mixing them, and I'm sure David would probably David pop in and maybe just there. go. There's no problem. I don't. He knows the programming side way more than I do. You know, I, I, what I do know is like I, if I'm gonna use set up a system with AU, I set everything up with AU. If we're gonna use VST VST3, I set everything up with VST3. What I will say is that sometimes you can get one. This is gonna sound. This is again. This is so nitpicky for me, but. Like I hate seeing like I'm I'm not gonna use all 18, 16, 24, 32 outputs of this plugin. So sometimes there are versions of the plugins that if you pop them up, they don't show all 32 outputs. Mm -hmm. So if I go to contact, for example, I believe that if I do the audio unit of contact, it only shows me two outputs. But if I go to the VST version of contact, then I've got this silly monster taking up a ton of space we also Actually, have uh, matt control, i think you're but... not sharing your screen we also have a uh, david oh, is waving at yeah, i'm gonna pull him in quickly um how's it going david uh, hey guys i'm sorry i wasn't here earlier oh no worries uh, i had to go to the eye doctor um i i don't think you may not know this and many other users may not know this 
there is an option in Gig Performer for a plugin to reduce the number of outputs and inputs that are actually displayed. So when you throw in that mm. contact with 32 or 64 outputs, you can right click and select the maximum number of outputs that should be shown for that particular plugin. And then that you can squish it down. I typically, yeah. So right click. Yeah. I can't see it's very small. Yeah. To see um, uh, max, max audio, audio channels. Yeah. So go there and select say four, which four or eight, which is what I usually do. Eight or for whatever you want. Yeah. And hit it. Yep. Look at that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> well now, so now I don't care. UST or a VST or AU. I don't care anymore. I've changed my official stance. Oh gosh. Yeah. That is a nifty feature. I, I, I do end up using that a decent amount. And it will remember, and it will remember that for that instance. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you, you know, and so sometimes it's quicker, just duplicate it if you want another one with the same, but uh, yeah, you can just, yeah. So mm -hmm. I love it. And your official stance yeah. is AU and VST versus VST three. They're all the same. Um, the answer is a very definite, it depends. First okay. of all, there really isn't any problem mixing them. Um, it okay. doesn't matter. Um, in terms of functionality and reliability, a lot really depends how they were built. So for example, some plugins are built with a cross-platform library and they're pretty much all the same. It doesn't matter. Some, you know, somebody might build a VST and somebody else might build the AU and one might work better than the other because some of the code is different. I, I have seen that. I've had I've had a couple of plugins that it's been known like the this VST version is a little bit buggier. There was a there was an organ one that did that for a while. I forgot. You know, yeah, I don't want to. I'm not going to trash VB, it. VB three. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, might, it was one that like there was an organ one that I had that the rotary speaker function on the VST. If you oh if you turn on the rotary effect, it worked fine on the AU. But if you turn on the rotary effect in VST at the time, it crashed and yeah. like Same that was an implementation issue. But to answer Tim's question that just popped up. The, the efficiency is 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 a red herring. If they were built with the same cross-platform library, you know the process block and the audio handling is going to be it's the same code running in both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, so you know AU is Apple's wants to have their own thing. VST was the Steinberg. I personally prefer. I use VST everywhere. Um, I don't use AUs at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I I don't see any point it's just you know the, the a i and i still use vst2 mm -hmm. again because i seem to be more reliable than a lot of vst threes that people are still um you know struggling with in some in some cases but the efficiency thing you know depends the code base if two different programmers wrote the two different versions and they did them independently who knows <laughs> but most of the time the underlying audio stuff is going to be the same in both so there's there's no there's no real benefit to one over the other and yeah. the nice thing about vst is you can copy the whole thing over to a windows machine I well yeah that's the other thing i was going to say when i save sessions if i know that someone else might open it up i almost always use vst because then you know that it'll have a little bit more universal compatibility Mm -hmm. from uh right. you know from one of the next thanks for popping on david All right. okay we were about to seamlessly transition into unloading articulations um yeah yeah that and that was you know so that that definitely brings up um another thing that i do so i really w one of the things that i like to do when uh we're looking at you know someone's machine or someone's rig that they've set up is to look at articulations and things of string libraries or of choral libraries, all these different libraries. Now they use scripting, right? So they load up sometimes every possible articulation and you can save, um, you know, efficiency and more importantly too, not accidentally trigger um, something else when you're in there. So let's say I open up contact. I'm, I'm looking for the literally the most efficient string sound I can possibly make, right? We're going to rip everything mm -hmm. out that I'm not using. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go to the contact factory library and grab their string sound. All right. We'll just grab string ensemble. If you take a look here, okay, these are the different articulations like sustain, forte piano, sforzando. And so if I put on pizzicato, you've got those pizzicato strings. If I go to sustain, I've got a sustain sound. Um, but if I'm only going to use 
the sustain sound, loading up all these others is just not necessary. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to unload them by clicking on here. And you'll see you can do that in so many different libraries. So if I unload all of them, we're down to a 13 megabyte string sound. Mm -hmm. You can't get more efficient than that. You know, like that's that's like really, really small, really tiny. You know, the computer's barely going to notice you're even using it. And I'm not, you know, shilling for contact. You can do this in lots of different libraries. You can do this in UVI libraries. You can do this in tons of them. This is just the first one I grabbed. The other thing you'll probably want to do is, you know, make it so that you can't trigger these accidentally. So I go ahead and I send them down to sounds that are, you know, notes that are below the keyboard that I couldn't possibly hit. Because I said, I've seen people not test that note in practice. And then when they get out on stage, they get inspired to add that lower octave in the left hand. And all of a sudden the strings are now playing a tremolo or something. Yep. So yep. it's good for danger's sake, but it's also good for CPU's sake. Um, I, I like to unload anything that we're not using you know, in that particular sound and just make sure that that sound is as lean and mean as it can be. Um, do you use purging I, at all? Do you like, do you purge any of this stuff? You can. Yeah. Yeah. You can purge right there. So you can, you know, purge all the samples that you're not using. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, then, then play the problem is then it loads them one at a time. You'll see my memory is large. It's, it's really hard to see on the screen, but it's like 1.28 megabytes. And as I play every single sound, uh, sure, it's starting sure, sure. to add more, you know, yeah. So I guess, you know, I, I guess I don't, I don't know that I, you know, need to go that crazy. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would do that if I was really, really worried, but, uh, you know, for me, the most important thing is just unloading those articulations you don't use the yeah. bigger, the sound. So if I go to like session strings pro or one of the more robust libraries, the more difference that makes, you mm -hmm. know, like those bigger libraries. So that might make the difference between being able to use a bigger library or not. So if I've got, you know, a guy who's doing this, he's got his piano string sound. Um, and maybe he's like, well, it's, you know, I really want to use my strings that I like the big one. Let's do it. And that might be a thing that we go in. Okay. But we don't, you're never going to use pizzicato, right? So let's just take that articulation out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like that kind of thing. So Michael's question, you know, about do they become less important in an M1 Ultra? I would say they are they are important all the time. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes because it's not always about performance. It's about stability and reliability. And as I indicated before with with David, like I've had stuff crash, you know, not because it was overloading the computer but it's just because that particular feature crashed, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that, so like, if you're not going to use pizzicato strings, why have the computer load them? You know, if you're not going to use that, I am always, you know, I am, I am about making it as lean and mean and that it will never crash when it's road tested. And that's, I am, you know, I'll knock on wood. Now I'm going to be cursed now that I'm saying it online, <laughs> I'm dropping the, dropping it down. But my rigs don't crash. Like they, they just don't, you know, like they, I, we, we stress test them so much. And then I lock it down and say, this computer will no longer be used for anything, but turning it on running the gig and then going, going to town, you know, but even, mm -hmm. even for people that are not touring and that are, you know, like myself, just playing in more, you know, robust situations, you know, meager or modest situations uh, and have to use their computer for other stuff. I haven't had mine crash. I haven't, you know, the brontosaurus thing aside, like that, that was sort of a crazy physical thing with power. Uh, the, I haven't had this go down live because I am so meticulous about, going in and unloading stuff I don't want to use and thinking, you know, six ways from Sunday before I add a new plugin into my system. Like, do I need this? Do I really, is this, you know, how is this going to enhance my rig and how's it going to, you know, can I use a sound that I've already got loaded somehow, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so there's um, an article about purging on the website. If you want to check that out, but this is just like good practice. Like how do, how are we intentional with the resource that we do have? And if you're Absolutely. always doing that, then your computer is going to thank you greatly. Um, it will. I, I like, there is a satisfaction and, and there's a safety and there's a psychological weight off your shoulders when you open up a gig file and page down to the last sound and it goes from one to the next without a blip, without a skip, without anything. You know, when that does that, you feel, oh, it's going to be okay. 
you know, yep. like that's that's it. So and I and I like that. You know, I like that before we do do a thing. While I've got you know while I've got this screen up, well that will bring us to another thing. Like I can unload this reverb, for example. So let's say mm -hmm. I'm going to set up my own reverb in the global rack space, which I can and should do. You know, I, I all these plugins might have different reverbs, and I've got 50 different reverbs loaded up now. If I've got 50 plugins going on, you know, so there's no need for that. I could save myself time by loading one reverb at the beginning of my concert. So I might take this reverb off right out of the plugin. So now I got a super dry, yes, extremely dry. Go to my global rack space and throw up, you know, one of my favorite reverbs. Now let's just grab, uh, we'll grab Pure Plate. I can't, what a time to be live. I can run UAD plugins on the road without having to bring my interface now. Yeah. I love it. All right. So I got a pure plate up there and that's where I can use my from rack spaces to rack spaces, right? And I can send it out to the rack space or I could just send it out to the, you know, main outputs there. And now I can take that, you know, contact and send it out to my rack space to get my reverb. That's so I might throw... Process. Yeah, I might throw an audio mixer up there just so I can adjust the, you know, balance of it as I do. But let's just yep. send the to and the from. And, we, I, you know, we did a video on, um, we've done a video on how to not have to set these up every single time as well, right? To set yep. presets, right? You can make your presets. So I know you're like, oh my God, I'm going to have to do this every time. No, you, you won't though, because you could save it all as a preset, you know, when you're done. So now I send that out to my audio mixer. I'll send the audio mixer to the global rack space. Oh, I don't even need the from, right? I already yep. did that in the global. So yep. there you go. So now if I increase this, well, I'll take it out. Dry. And there's my reverb. Yep. So, you know, and I've got it there. And again, you, you, you can, if you want to, select it all and save that as my string sound. And now I won't have to set up the reverb. Or you could just set up the... The reverb setup as your as your patch, right? You could just say anytime I want reverb, here you go. I'm going to use that and then go for it. So uh, the, do these options? Uh, oh, sorry, I was just looking at Michael's question. Do these options exist on most sounds? They really do um, exist on most sounds. Like, oh, that's that's one of the reasons why I do it because I start going like every synth sound I bring up, or you know, I'm like, what do I need all these 19 different reverbs? Like sometimes I do, right? If I've got a drum sound, maybe I just want the room reverb. And but in general, like if I've got all these different sounds, I, I, I you know, I, I really try to think about how many different reverbs I actually really need. And I do like to use global global reverbs rather than use the ones. First of all, you know, not for nothing. Again, not to poop on anyone's sounds, but like my UAD Pure Plate reverb, I like that reverb a hell of a lot better than the tiny little reverb that some synth company might have just thrown in at the last minute. You know what I mean? Yep. To to like this is a better reverb. You, so that it's almost like a way that you can tell these artists or tell yourself, hey, you can use a better reverb for less resources if you do it this way. You know, you, you, you're saving resources and you're using a better reverb in a lot of cases. Um, you know, I certainly can't pull up Capital Chambers reverb on every sound, you know, in my library, but I can pull up one Capital Chambers reverb and send everything to it. And I love that reverb. So, you know, just to yep. do it. Yeah, so. Global rack space this way is, um, it's really nice. To, it's really nice to have. And then it can be accessed from any sound at any point. So anytime you send two Global rack space one and two, it's going to hit that reverb and you'll have it. Um, which, which is massive. Yeah. So you can, you can do that with, and you can do that with lots of different sounds. I mean, you can, you can use, you know, that fancy chorus. Like I, I like to use like a, you know, the space, the, the old role in like space echo, you know, mm -hmm. delay, or, uh, I use the dimension D chorus, um, uh, or a CE chorus. Uh, I use those on a lot of synth sounds. I mean, and again, it's like sometimes these different sound manufacturers, the amount of money and time they spend on sampling the sound is drastic. It's like great, great efforts. And then they're like, then they'll just use the built-in engine. You know, look, I, I love Contact, but, you know, the built-in chorus sound on Contact is not anywhere near the specific chorus sound that I purchased and I use separately, right? So if I just pop up, if I'm using their Fender Road sound, I use my own chorus with it and... A, I'm saving resources, and B, it just sounds better, you know? Yep, absolutely. And for even if you don't have favorites, Gig Performer has, like, the, the quick entry. Like, I think it's Command-P, 
where you can type a string in. Do you know what I'm talking about, Matt? Um, um, yeah, let me see. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Insert a plugin right from there. Yeah. So if you're like trying to add a lot of things quickly and you use that shortcut, you can pull in blocks as fast as you can yep. type by hitting enter, which is a massive um, time saver. Okay. Uh, what do you do with your licenses? Do you keep your licenses? So, or- yeah, I. it's funny, but I, I, I actually would, I prefer to keep them on the computer. Mm-hmm. I really do. Um, so if I, I've, first of all, I, I, I hate that we have to do it. I understand we do. I understand piracy and I understand all that stuff. I, mm-hmm. I, when I was reviewing, um, you know, when I review a lot of stuff, I actually part, I put the copy protection in as part of the review because there are some companies that don't give you, like they want you to use the dongle. So they give you one license to go on the dongle and that's it. And they're like, well, just take it with you. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. If I drop that dongle, I'm down, you know, forever. So I give, I, I, I used to really mention that a lot and still do in my reviews of certain plugins. And I'll say, okay, this company, like UVI, for example, they give you three licenses. I think that's incredibly user-friendly. Like, mm-hmm. I think it's fantastic. I have a license on my computer in my studio. I have a license on my laptop. And then I got a backup license that... God forbid, you know, something happens. I need to quickly load it onto an, my new laptop or something, and I forgot or wh- whatever. That yeah, is consumer friendly. Yeah, yeah, and that's that, that's what I love. I mean, I love that. So, yeah, I don't like using I don't like using the physical eye lock. Um, you know, I I I I actually that is one of the things that will make me consider another plugin. If there's a plugin that makes you use the physical eye lock because of their single license or whatever, I actively really, 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 really think about it before I invest in that plugin. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't like it when that happens. You know, I, I, I prefer a little bit more user forward. You know, most consumers are not looking to rip people off. I know there are a lot of those bad actors out there, but most people that are buying the plugin, if they're paying for it, like they, they just want to be able to use it, you know, mm-hmm. one at a time as you're supposed to on, mm-hmm. on one device. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So here's a question from Michael. Do you need to save these as different presets versus the compact default to load less? Or do you do that? By uh, you do. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm always thinking I'm building this stuff from the ground up most of the time. Um, so I haven't actually tried that yet, but I would imagine, yeah, of course, any parameters, when you save a preset, right, Brett, it saves all the parameters of that preset the way it is. So if you do what you just did with the contact, and you unloaded that yeah. stuff and you save your gig performer file, gig performer will know what you did in contact. So it, yeah, it yeah, of course. Really, yeah. 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 Um, I, I think I'm talking about the preset, like the block with contact and the, um, if you save your contact instrument as a, as a favorite, uh, as a oh, favorite. Yeah. It should. I, I, it will save all of the parameters that you had set up when you saved it as a favorite. So whatever you do, yep. if you right mouse click and save it, it's all included. Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I can confirm because I just did it right now as we were sitting there and <laughs> just loaded up, yeah. loaded up the test, and everything is unloaded already. Everything has those, you know, key switches turned off. So yeah, that's it, it. And that it, it is really like it is important. Again, it, it's not even sometimes it's not even just about saving the resources. It's about just accidentally triggering a new key switch that you didn't want to. Yep. Which um, also, uh, the way I've always done that is by just using the MIDI in block. Like I just filter off the bottom end of my MIDI in block so that I can't trigger C negative zero. Um, for sure. Anyway, but it's, it's, it's essentially what you did. It's just a different, different way. Um, okay. Yep. Matt. So can you talk about, I mean, I guess the next point is like keeping your operating system clean, but can you yeah, talk that's... about the whole user thing? Like, I can. Yeah. Then, you know, maybe it's in practices. Yeah. So I've got two things that are, you know, really important. Um, You know, one is that I make it a point um, every year to do an operating system audit on both my live performance laptop and on my studio machine. I do not upgrade more than one operating system ahead. Um, And what I, what I mean by that is if I just op, you know, let's say whether it's windows 11 or whether it's Mac, if I just upgraded to Monterey right now, which I did, you know, like I upgraded my machine to Monterey, I will not upgrade to the next system. I will wipe the system entirely 
and then install the OS fresh. Mm -hmm. I would never recommend upgrading more than twice. Um, I, I, I am very, 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 very sort of anal retentive about keeping my operating system as fresh as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't like to keep on upgrading. And I'm, and I want to be clear, I'm not anti upgrading OSs. Um, I, I know there are people that will just use the same version of the software like forever once it works. I, I, I don't go by that either. You could, I, first of all, I can't. I always have to test these new plugins out with you know mm -hmm. new stuff. I, I have to make sure it works. Mm -hmm. But secondly, like I like getting the new features, so I'm not anti that. But I keep I, I don't upgrade more than twice. If I've upgraded once, the next time the next OS comes out, I do a clean wipe. I erase the whole computer, erase the whole hard drive. And then reinstall the operating system, reinstall the plugins. And I know before everyone cringes, I could tell you, I, I'll promise you two things. Number one, I'm not doing it to brag. I hate this part of my life. I have more plugins than you. I promise you I do because <laughs> I test, I, I review them and I test like I have thousands. So I'm, I promise you I have a lot. Number two, it never takes me more than um, two movies. That's how I do my time. I pop a movie up. I watch two movies while I'm doing it and you know, you can catch up on a show, binge watch something on Netflix mm -hmm. and you're done in a day. And then the next day you're using your machine. Everything feels super, super fresh. Now the mm -hmm. band aid for that is what you brought up and you asked about it. I'm sorry. It took so long to get to it, right. but the no. band aid, if you find that things are running really slow or buggy and crashing, one of the most common things I'll do, and I've, I've done this for people on the road. I've actually had them call from the road um, you know, and they, they were, they were bad boys or girls. They did not listen and they installed Roblox or they installed Fortnite or they, they used their computer for a bunch of other stuff. And then, um, you know, stuff like that happens. So when that happens, one of the ways you can get around that is by creating a new user on your machine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can make multiple users. I can make a user for my wife, for one of my kids making a fresh user with all fresh permissions and all that, you know, can sometimes give you, it can, it can, it can troubleshoot and take out, um, problems that you didn't even know were there. And that can be a band aid. I don't recommend doing that for no reason. I recommend doing that when, you know, I've got a gig file and every time I open up one specific, um, you know, instrument like, Oh, this one contact sample library, Every time I open it, it's crashing. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing I'll tell them is, okay, make a new user, just open that up and find out, you know, open the same file and see what happens. And I will tell you nine times out of 10, when they make a new fresh user, it works. And then it's all snappy and, and everything's like going faster. And that's how we can kind of figure out, okay, obviously something with your permissions is screwed up and you know, it's, it's with your user level permissions and it could be something as like a preference file, or it could be the permissions on a folder got changed and then got unchanged. Um, it could be something to do with, you know, what, what it was one time with, with, with everything is cloud-based now. And some of these plugin companies have not caught up to the fact that your documents folder might have references to files and not the actual files inside it. Mm -hmm. So, um, my iCloud documents folder on my Mac, for example, um, positive grid plugins uh, from BIOS for the longest time, they stored all of their setup configuration in your documents folder. Well, the Mac doesn't know that. And it would just decide, oh, you haven't used that plugin in 30 days. You must not be using those documents. We'll upload them to the cloud and they're gone. And then every time I opened up BIOS AMP, it crashed the computer every single time. And then I made a new user and then, of course, when I made the new user and put in my iCloud info, it freshly downloaded all those documents and it worked again. And that's how I discovered that was the problem. Like, oh, that's so now I got to just make sure, you know, so that's that kind of stuff. A new user can quickly fix that stuff for you in a pinch mm -hmm. for sure. And that problem would have come back, though, in 30 days. Right. Which is why it's just a Band-Aid. Yeah, well, that and that's why, and that's one of the reasons I think that Bias has since stopped storing mission critical stuff in the documents folder, and now only stores like presets. And then that's not so bad, you know. Maybe a preset doesn't pop up, and you just right click and download them. So that kind of, you know, hops onto what Michael was saying about using two computers in sync with Dropbox and iCloud. Um, so one of the things that I do is, you know, I will often, uh, well, first of all, I mean, if it if you know, if it's a mission critical thing, like if I got an artist going out on tour and it's a, 
massive thing, uh, ain't no iCloud going on that computer right. <laughs> or Dropbox <laughs> right. or anything that uses Wi-Fi. Like literally we, we are locking that machine down. But for me, for myself, I'm in the same thing as you are, Michael. Like I, what I just described happened. Like I was trying to, I couldn't figure it out. I was getting ready to go live. And every time I opened this guitar amp simulator, it was crashing the app. And then I discovered it was iCloud uploading. So what I do is now as a matter of habit, um, before a live show, I right click my documents folder and I just download and make sure that everything is downloaded on the machine before I start. And then I turn off Wi-Fi for a show that kind of jumps into one of my bonus round things I was going to bring up. I know we're yeah, running we're a long good. time, we're but good. I will, I will throw out there like my live machines, all notifications are off. Mm -hmm. uh, no notifications ever coming up on my live machines. I've got a do not disturb that will pop up notifications. It only allows notification for a while. Apple didn't even let you do the do not disturb like permanently. They only let you do do not disturb for like a certain time. So I had do not disturb uh, all day long, except for 3 a.m. to 3.01 a.m. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> and then all the notifications would pop up and then they would clear within a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but now they let you do do not disturb. But the one thing that they do and windows does this too they will often do not disturb share across devices. So you have to turn that off because you'll turn on do not disturb on your computer. And then all of a sudden you don't realize you're not getting any phone calls because it followed you to your phone. And, you know, Windows and Android can do that as well. So you have to make sure that it's not sharing those settings across devices. My computers do not disturb is per perpetually on or focus, whatever they're calling it now. You know, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I want no notifications. I don't want anything downloading in the background. Dropbox, iCloud, all that stuff is like, you know, turned off when I'm playing a show. My Wi-Fi is turned off. My All that is off. I got it just super, super clean with nothing running. I have, you know, because look, I've, I've learned, you know, you, as they, the saying goes, you learn cause you've been burned. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, I had a friend, a teacher friend of mine FaceTime me in the middle of a show and I was reading the chart off my iPad and all of a sudden I just see her face like, hi, I'm like, are oh. you kidding me? So, you know, this, oh, is, no. this is important. You have to do this for all of our devices. Yeah. Um, yeah. do you have any thoughts on, on this one? Do you still run your plugins on an external drive? Um, I, so I don't do that for live for live. All of my samples are on the computer. I invest and I just, I bite the bullet and I run, I get the biggest SSD that my library, you know, my, my wallet can handle. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know that's not the answer people like to get. Um, mm -hmm. but it is what I do. I don't like running off external drives, uh, for live for the studio. Of course I've got, I mean, with the amount of plugins I have to have, I've got like four or five of them stacked on top of each other back there. But um, I definitely, I recommend running them on the internal as much as possible. If you have to run them on an external, I really try to, you know, that is the times where I invest in more rugged and robust drives that plug in and snap in really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like back in the day when you used to buy a best, an HDMI cable at Best Buy for $90, right? Like you'd laugh and be like, well, there's no difference between the cables. Well, well, there is if it unplugs easily. So right. when I invest in USB-C cables, like I make sure that they are not going to unplug. I don't want a flaccid USB-C cable that's just going to like pop right out. I want one that is going to be jammed in there and, you know, and really stick in there. I mean, that's important for your audio interface too. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need, it makes no one happy when that happens. Absolutely. So if anybody has any last minute questions for Matt, feel free to pop them in the chat. But Matt, our last minute question for you is if somebody was brand new to Gig Performer and never used it before, what tip would you give them to get them started on the right foot? So what I like to do is I, I like to, I like to not necessarily experiment aimlessly because I feel like then you just come up with another list of stuff you don't know and it can feel overwhelming. I like to start, um, I almost look at it like a recipe, you know, like following a recipe when you're going to bake something. Mm -hmm. And I start with like, all right, I need a piano sound. Great, cool, I figured that out. Let me do that a couple of times. I'll make another piano sound with chorus on it. I'll make another piano sound with reverb on it. Just make sure, okay, now I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Next step, I'm going to make layers. All right, let me make a piano string sound. Let me make mm -hmm. a piano choir sound. Like I always try to build knowledge upon previous knowledge. I feel mm -hmm. like if you try to dive right into the end result of the recipes, you're like, but I want cookies. 
Well, I mean, you know, before you bake cookies, you do have to know how to pour milk into a a measuring cup and measure, you know, and measure. And, and before you, so all those other steps are important. So what I would say is that try to think of Gig Performer like a recipe and building knowledge upon previous knowledge. Start mm-hmm. with, okay, I'm going to make this sound. Now I'm going to add that sound into something else. Now I'm going to add another use case. Now that I've got 10 sounds, it might be a good time to learn how to put those sounds in a set list. Um, if you try to go from the beginning and say, I need to remake my entire keyboard rig in Gig Performer, I'm gonna, I need to do that today, that's when you'll get unsuccessful. I think you'll be more successful if you start from scratch. And one of the things that I think you'll find is you will surprise yourself and come up with sounds and come up with ways of doing things that you might not have before if you were only trying to get your specific end use case in there. So mm-hmm. I have found lots of neat combinations of sounds and lots of interesting ways to do things specifically from doing it that way and trying to, you know, build one thing on top of the other. I always take my step and then go, all right, I made this step. Let me build the next step on top of the next one. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. It also sounds like you plan curriculum. Um, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Learning how to learn. It's like uh, amazing. Okay. I guess we have two questions coming in here. Do you have a backup? I assume you have a backup. So that's a great question. Um, You know, in many tours, they do, like when I'm designing for a tour. So, you know, Dave Rosenthal for Billy Joel has like two Mac Pros that run under the stage and they switch from one to the other. But that's Billy Joel. They -hmm. can afford that, you know. Mm -hmm. Can I? No. My backup is, uh, I actually do have a backup though. My little mini backup plan is I've got basic sound setups on both my iPhone and my iPad. Uh, you know, running Korg module or something. And and so if I needed to, I could Bluetooth, you know, MIDI over to my, one of my devices and I could play a show with that. So I have it, you know, rolling and I, I have a backup, like couple of basic sounds ready to go on my iPad that if the show needed it, I could plug in and just quickly get at least piano, you know, sounds like that. But really that, that you know, one of the reasons I switched over to gig performer is to not need a backup, you know, not again, not to poo poo other people's software, but a lot of the other live hosting software is not quite as stable and reliable. I like how snappy gig performer is and I like that it doesn't crash on me. So Mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons I picked it. I still do have a backup. I will tell you that I've never used the backup. Mm -hmm. I'll knock on wood. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what it is. Um, If you're, Ludo, just in case you were asking this question, um, Time Machine is a great way to back your stuff up. Um, if if you're talking about backing up your files to like make sure you don't lose anything, because it will give you versioned backups. So, yeah. um, but in terms of a backup, and I use iCloud. I mean, I keep my gig. I have a in my documents folder. I have a folder called Synth Patches, and that that yep. that's where my gig performer patches go. Yeah. So my gig files are in there and. They are backed up. If I dropped this computer in the ocean, I would open up my laptop and all those patches would still be there. It's very assuring, isn't it? Um, yeah. All right. Last question. Oh, it's not letting me put it up. Hi. There we go. Um, how do you protect your computer in live situations? Um, any thoughts on Oh, yeah. That? 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I again, I... I do get to design these cool tour stuff, but I'm a weekender as well. I, I love playing and I, I play out all the time and I like to use my computer when I'm playing out. So I, I do invest in good gear to hold my computer. Um, I do, you know, I am a, I'm a diva that way. Like my, I have nice mic stands. I have nice keyboard stands. So I, I have um, one of the things I do, first of all, I do have a case around my MacBook. So, you know, you, I, I've got like a nice little plastic case that if it did drop, I'd be okay. Um, I mean, maybe not from the top of a building, but certainly if uh, from the top of my keyboard stand, I'd be all right. Uh, the second thing I do, uh, I, use, um, I use a Spider Stand Pro. I'm looking over there. It's a K&M Spider Stand Pro um, keyboard stand. And the clamp that goes on the top that clamps the laptop is quite robust. The other one, uh, Roland, makes a really nice laptop stand that goes on a mic stand. Um, I only use that, um, with a very stable mic stand. So I have one of those like RKO radio from back in the day, mic stands that like the bass is like 
40 pounds, you know, massive mic stand base, but yeah. it clamps the laptop, which is what I like. So yes, it is on top of a mic stand, but I'll tell you, it's clamped on. That laptop isn't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, I, I, that, that's one of the things that I do as well. I don't put my mic stand. Um, the, the other option too, which is kind of nice, the, is that, um, Arturia makes uh, a key, a controller, the key lab 88 mm-hmm. that actually makes a shelf for the laptop that extends out from the back of the keyboard. That is fantastic yep. because then the the laptop is not. I mean, the the shelf is deep enough that that laptop is not going down unless my entire keyboard topples over. Like that's you know we're good. So those are the ways that I I kind of uh, do. I, I think about that a lot. Yeah, I I don't. Uh, whenever I do gig with my computer, I bring my stuff. I don't show up and then go. I guess I'll put this on whatever's nearby. No, 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 no. <laughs> right. Yeah, For sure. Absolutely. Um, I feel like this is relevant, and we'll wrap up here. But um, Troy said he sweated on his MIDI controller, and it was spitting out massive amounts of CC data, which is a thing that could happen. Um, and then he learned to filter out MIDI CCs in MIDI in blocks. Um, and the reason yeah. I wanted to throw this up there is because this is an am- amazing best practice. Like, save a favorite version of your MIDI in block with everything filtered out except for sustain note on and note off and use that block Um, because you don't want in my personal opinion you don't want to use the pre-mapped anything that's the reason for widgets um that is i had dust i had that happen to me at the nam show Uh (laughs) absolutely yeah it was one you know the guy before me just ramped on one of the knobs and and it was, uh, I, I think it was like, it was literally like CC7. It was like volume. like, oh, <laughs> And it was no. just jumping from zero to 100, like constantly. And I had to quickly figure out how to filter that out. So yeah, that is absolutely a best practice to be <laughs> able to just have a keyboard ready to go, like a, a, a MIDI in with just the, your sustain pedal and your, and your notes. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's massively important. Uh, David is wanting to come on. Hold on. Welcome, David. Hi. Uh, one comment on there because I do the same thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you when you configure a MIDI in block, and you disable and you block a whole bunch of things, when you save that as a new preset, for example, that preset will show up in your pop up menus and your quick plugin insert. So once you want to start using it, it doesn't take any more time than inserting any other kind of block. So yeah. it doesn't impact your workflow to pre-design those, they become available just as easily as everything else. Mm-hmm. And also, to add to that, it it doesn't mean you can't use what's blocked. It just means it has to be mapped to a widget to access it. Yeah. Also, another, tr- another trick while we're on, on tips is yeah. I'll sometimes have two MIDI in blocks, one just designed to pass a particular um, CC message through to something if I can't do a widget. Most of the time, I'll use widgets and host automation and try not to use MIDI MIDI for controlling plugins at all. But if you have to, you can also just have a separate MIDI in block just for that purpose. That could yep. be happy too. Yep. Thank awesome. you. Thank you so much, David. Um, all right. Did you have a thought, Matt? Has something ticked your mind there? No, I, I think I just said it, it's, it is good practice because that's the one thing that could be out of your control. You know, like you show up and the, that keyboard starts. I, I mean, I've even... Um, I've disabled other MIDI channels just to make sure like yeah. nothing hap- nothing weird is happening. I mean, again, I, one of the gigs I do a lot is, I mean, I do play the NAMM show a lot. Um, and that's like this big conference in LA for those of you guys that aren't, you know, into that kind of thing. But like at that show, there's, you know, there's hundreds of bands, hundreds over the course of a week. That keyboard is going to be wonky by the end of the week. Everyone's been hitting it, touching it, you know? So, uh, definitely a very good practice to have that stuff ready. Mm -hmm. Um, It's probably, you know, it might not worry so much if you're using like your own gear, but again, as, as some, as Troy pointed out, you might sweat on it. (laughs) It could happen. Yeah. You you just never know. Um, Well, Matt, thanks so much. This has been like, I'm like, how many, how many videos can we chop this into? That's what I'm wondering. How many YouTube shorts can this make? Um, There you (laughs) go. Anyway, but thank you guys so much for being with us. Thank you, Matt, for your generous time and expertise. Um, My if pleasure. you would like to connect with Matt, Matt has a website, um, which is in the description. 
And you can check out Matt's website and connect with him via the contact form on his site. Um, and Matt, you are available for hire, right? Like you're you absolutely. Do, you, you also mix. I don't know if we talked yep. about that live. So he also does mixing and recording. If you're in the New York area, um, do you also teach Matt? Do you teach key stuff or not I do? Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I do a a lot of educational content. I teach, you know, I I teach in public school, this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, I do mixing and I, you know, consult on rigs for people. And, you know, that's, I, I like that a lot. There's something fun about like getting someone's rig really dialed in and, uh, you know, you go to a concert and see them playing a rig that you helped them design. So it's pretty neat, you know? Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, so Matt's available for hire also if you're looking for some of the things that he does. Um, but friends, thank you so much. Um, next week, no stream, but we will have uh, Miko's video, uh, same time as, as our normal stream. And um, week after that, uh, Songmaster. So thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. And we'll see you all in two weeks.